is good. So for those who are here for the first time, um, we will be having a discussion as well as reading from the suttas. And we're using this wonderful book by the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi that he's compiled along the theme of social and communal harmony. And it's a really beautiful anthology of discourses that covers various training topics. So we're now on the chapter three called Dealing with Anger. And um, sometimes we get through a couple of passages, <laughs> uh, sometimes even three or four. But a lot of the time we do have some discussion around these teachings, because I think that's when the Buddha's teachings really start to come to life, you know, where we can make them our own and we can apply them to our experience and use them in ways which really will help to alleviate some of the suffering and the difficulty, the struggle, um, the dis-ease in life and help us find a bit more uh, peace around our experience, whatever that may be. So obviously, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Buddha's teachings and probably done a fair bit of meditation, but it's always important to remember that the Buddha's teachings are not necessarily to change our lives or to change the content of our experience, but more to help us relate to that in a wise way. Of course, we can change things where possible. And it's always, um, you know, if you're coming from a place of kindness, compassion, letting go, renunciation of self-interest, selfish desire, then it is coming from the right place and it can lead to wholesome action. But we're limited sometimes in how much we can really do to affect uh, societal change. Fortunately, we can always change our own mini society because I don't know about you, but I see that I have a lot of people living inside me, lots of uh, imaginary people that, you know, maybe I've met during the day and then fabricated in my mind. <laughs> so other people tend to live even within us. And of course, the most important person to have that wholesome relationship with is actually ourselves. So, uh, yeah, yeah. You're very welcome to write comments in the chat at any time. Sometimes I might read them out. If you're writing them directly to me, I'll presume that that is uh, for the sake of confidentiality. So generally speaking, I don't read people's names, but uh, yeah, sometimes I might. If, if it just feels that you have put it in there publicly, I might forget and read your name. Um, equally, when you do wish to speak, uh, you can raise your hand using the raise hand button at the bottom and uh, we'll come to you. The recording will record your voice, but not your video. So the video will stay pinned to me. If you don't want your voice recorded, just please write a comment or a question or anything else you wish to share in the chat. And again, you can write it to everyone if it's not confidential or if it's confidential, you can write it just to me. And uh, I may read it out, but without your name, okay? Lovely. So this week we are on chapter three and number three. And the passage heading is called Persons Like Vipers. And this is from the Anguttara 4, number 110. And... Similar to the last sutta that we read last week about the different kinds of person depending on their anger. Last week we talked about, yeah, three kinds of person. Um, one whose anger is like, like a line etched in stone. Um, one whose anger is like a line etched in the ground. And one whose anger is like a line etched in water. Okay. And we had quite a lot of discussion around that. You can watch the video recording if you missed it last week. And this week we're on the fours. So it's similar, but a little bit different um, angle, a different nuance. So I think I'm going to read through this whole passage um, and we can have some discussion on that afterwards. Okay. So the Buddha says, and I'll change the language to make it... Um, uh, what do you call it? Not gender neutral, but not uh, gendered, non-gendered. Okay, so here we go. And yeah, sometimes I'll say monastics, but it also refers to community as a whole. So here we'll use the word community. There are these four kinds of vipers. What for? 
the one whose venom is quick to come up, but not virulent. The one whose venom is virulent, but not quick to come up. The one whose venom is both quick to come up and virulent. And the one whose venom is neither quick to come up nor virulent. Is everybody understanding the English here, the word virulent? Yes, very good. These are the four kinds of vipers. So too, there are these four kinds of persons, similar to vipers, found existing in the world. And just to mention at this point that it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be fixed in one of these categories or that you need to, or that it's wise to make a sense of self out of any of this. I think they're more like states of mind that we can slip in and out of and maybe depending on our practice, depending on where we are on the path, we may shift from category to category or perhaps even depending on the particular incident that's causing anger, you know, sometimes um, certain things really seem to bother us and other things less so and that might change from person to person or from time to time. So they're just examples. And it might be interesting to reflect how this relates to you. So what for? Okay, so this is repeating the kinds of vipers, but now thinking of it as types of persons or states of mind. The one whose venom is quick to come up, but not virulent. The one whose venom is virulent, but not quick to come up. The one whose venom is both quick to come up and virulent. And the one whose venom is neither quick to come up nor virulent. And how, community, is a person whose venom, whose venom is quick to come up but not virulent? Here, someone often becomes angry, but their anger does not linger for a long time. It is in this way that a person is one whose venom is quick to come up but not virulent. So I say this person is just like a viper whose venom is quick to come up, but not virulent. And how is a person one whose venom is virulent, but not quick to come up? Here, someone does not often become angry, but their anger, anger lingers for a long time. It is in this way that a person is one whose venom is virulent, but not quick to come up. So I say this person is just like a viper whose venom is virulent, but not quick to come up. And how is a person, one whose venom is both quick to come up and virulent? So this is pretty dangerous, isn't it? Here, someone often becomes angry and their anger lingers for a long time. It is in this way that a, viper, that a person, sorry, is one whose venom is both quick to come up and virulent. So I say this person is just like a viper whose venom is both quick to come up and virulent. And how is a person one whose venom is neither quick to come up nor virulent? Here, someone does not often become angry and their anger does not linger for a long time. It is in this way that a person is one whose venom is neither quick to come up nor virulent. And so I say this person is just like a viper whose venom is neither quick to come up nor virulent. These community are the four kinds of persons similar to vipers found existing in the world. And Gunther's put the little uh, sutta reference there in the box if you want to read the whole sutta. So this is quite interesting and it just occurred to me whilst reading it that I was discussing snakes and my experience with snakes actually in uh, Australia with my friend Anna, whose house I'm staying in at the moment yesterday. And uh, I was thinking, you know, that in some cases, it seems as though animals that are the, lead, that are the most vulnerable have the strongest poison because it's their only defense. And perhaps that's similar here, you know, that we need to be angry when we feel vulnerable or we want to defend ourselves. So in a sense, it could actually be that the person who's angry is not um, necessarily strong or scary, but rather scared within themselves. I think that can definitely uh, be the case sometimes with anger. You know, we feel we need to defend ourselves in some way.
So it's quite interesting to me that in this sutta, um, the Buddha's talking about this virulence in terms of how quick the anger is to arise and also whether it lasts or not. Um, and this is one way to look at it, which we could explore a bit. But I'm also curious to hear from you if you think there are any other ways that anger can be virulent, you know, that, uh, that could make that anger more toxic or more um, poisonous, as well as how long it lasts. Are there any thoughts or comments so far? Diana's got her hand up. Sorry, Gunter, were you doing the questions tonight? Really? I will be asking Diana. Okay. That is exactly what I was thinking when you were reading the sutta, because I was expecting the virulence to be more connected to what one does with the anger, especially expressing it and causing harm to another person. Mm -hmm cruel words or, um, you know, things like that versus how long it lasts inside of me, which is going to be more damaging to myself Yeah. in terms of virulence. So I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. I'll ask Leah to unmute. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, Venerable. Hi. Hi, hi everybody. Um, well, my question actually is, what about anger that is not expressed? Like, you know, say for example, somebody has hurt you or you hurt somebody and you repress this anger. And so the relationship with this person is, let's say strained or you avoid the confrontation because um, you don't want to hurt somebody. So how do you, <laughs> how do you, you know, because that anger hurts you, you know, uh, mm, you don't want yeah. to hurt somebody. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure if the question is like asking for some methods or how that well, relates to well, well, or... No, well, where, where does the, where does the Buddha put this? <laughs> where, right, right. Where is this classified? Yeah, yeah. Well, interestingly, it actually comes up in the next little passage, I think, because it's talking oh, okay. about resentment. But I do think that resentment is one of the ways that that anger um, becomes more virulent, becomes mm. more toxic. And um, sometimes this can happen when we suppress, you know, when we're not able to actually process those feelings or, or perhaps we stigmatize the anger, you know, anger comes up in our minds and we say, this is bad. This makes yeah. me a bad person. You know, I shouldn't be angry. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I was definitely brought up to feel that anger is not a good emotion to have. Yeah, and sure. that if I am angry, you know, there's a danger that love might be withdrawn. And so I've internalized that to a degree whereby um, if anger arises, it very quickly turns in on myself. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I think then it is virulent in terms of, you know, harming ourselves. Yeah. And uh, yeah, maybe it stays in the kind of subconscious part of the mind. And I think that with the practice of meditation, for me anyway, um, a large part of the practice is getting in contact with the way I'm feeling and with the way my emotional world works and really learning to have the courage and have the gentleness and the kindness to embrace that and to go into that and to understand what's happening. And I found that if I'm able to do that with, you know, before things build up, that if there is irritation or anger, it, it comes up fairly quickly and it passes away quickly too. Yeah. But it's, so, a, it's, in, it's, 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 it's in the next passage, right? So it's not quite in the, the four. Um, I guess anything that you really want to put there could be there, um, but it does talk in the next one about how we kind of fester and how resentment builds up mm. Yeah, by unskillful ways of thinking, more or less. Thank you. Welcome. I'm going to ask Janaki to unmute.
I'm going for both. Hi. I, I think, I mean, I have uh, read about this um, anger or in Pali, what is called dvesha. Yeah. It's actually out of fear, that's what I have read. Um, and even in psychology, um, as well as in Buddhism, I mean, Buddhism is much older than psychology. Um, it, it is really very bad for the health, the general well-being of the person itself. Um, if I become angry, it's it's bad for me than the person, uh, you know, uh, that I show my anger. But um, uh, and it, it says it is due to the fear. It's an inbuilt fear inside us. So it's a sort of a animal instinct. So what the Buddha was trying to do was to improve the state of the human being from that state uh, to elevate its position from the animal state that the emotional mind, the animals have the emotional part much more developed than the human beings. So that's what Buddha was trying to do to bring the human being from the normal state to, uh, to the supernormal or the supranormal. That's what I have um, heard and read as well. Probably you may say something about it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, great. It's definitely one way to um, interpret the general thrust of the Buddha's teaching. Certainly it's about purifying our mind and bringing ourselves out of these kind of habitual conditioned kind of, if you wish, instinctive animalistic impulses that we might have, you know, just react blindly. And I think certainly, you know, anger can stem from fear. I think it can also, sometimes there's a sadness beneath anger. You know, there's an emotion that's arising in us and we don't want that emotion because it makes us feel vulnerable and therefore we become angry with that emotion or with our own emotions, with our own feelings, um, because that gives us more of a sense of control perhaps or more of a solid sense of self. Um, but I think the root cause of all these defilements, you know, especially greed and anger is actually delusion. You know, we're actually misperceiving reality. So the Buddha defined delusion as actually um, seeing happiness where there's actually suffering, you know, perceiving things as permanent when they're actually impermanent, yeah? perceiving things as beautiful where there's ugliness or vice versa. I think it can go both ways. And also seeing, you know, taking things as a self when they're really just conditioned processes. You know, everything we experience, what we take to be a self is basically um, a process of cause and effect that's been conditioned by the input that we've received, maybe genetics to some degree, you know, the experiences we've had in our lives, the social input, the education, all of these kind of things are part of that. And so it's really from not seeing things as they really are, the anger, craving, and all the other hindrances arise. Yeah, because if we really see that there's nothing in here, there's nothing really worth clinging to, there's nothing really worth um, fighting over, yeah? And also that anger and all the defilements just cause us suffering, then we'll actually just drop it, you know? It's as simple as uh, the Buddha often gives this simile about holding a hot coal. You know, you don't have to tell somebody who picks up a hot coal to put it down, it burns you. And you're the one that first gets burned before you can throw that at anyone else. And I think it's the same with anger. And that means that, you know, when we actually see anger with insight, we, there's no need to suppress it. We just don't want to go there, right? We just don't want to uh, hold on to it or to express it or try and harm someone else. Yeah. But I think it's important to also, uh, before we get to that stage, not to push it down in a way that is suppressing. Um, it's healthier, I feel, to actually experience the arising of the anger and experience it in, you know, with mindfulness, with awareness, um, and without acting it out. So there is a sort of um, middle step to be taken there, you know, between actually experiencing the anger and letting it go. And that is learning its nature, you know, learning to stay with it and not to react, not to respond in unwholesome ways. So I don't know if some of that 
speaks to your question. I can see there's also a question in the box. Shall I go to that next? Shall I do that? Can you talk about how to let go of the attachments to anger and fear? Yeah, so I guess this relates a little bit to what I was saying um, and also what Janneke just wrote in the chat box there, that whether it's inside or outside, anger burns you. And I think this is probably one of the best ways to start um, the process of letting go, because once you realize it's causing suffering, you know, who wants to hold on to suffering, really? I mean, at first, we may not know anything else. So there may be a fear in letting it go because by, you know, softening to the anger, by opening to the anger, you might start to uncover deeper emotions there. There might be a feeling of deep loneliness or maybe despair or helplessness, something that's still related to the, you know, the aspect of dosa or dresha, the aversion, but that's slightly softer and perhaps more vulnerable. Yeah. And so I think we have to go very, very gently and really learn to meet all of our emotions in, um, in a gentle way, and also not to stay there too long in the beginning, yeah? So it's not that if anger's arising, you have to say, right, I need to sit with this, I need to penetrate it, I need to just stay with it at all costs. It's more like just learning to put your foot in the water and test the temperature, and then get out again, you know? And then walk in again, maybe go up to your knee this time. Okay, it's all right. I can stay here a while and come back out. So in the same way, you can use your mindfulness like that. You can go literally toward any emotion, any physical feeling in the body that maybe is associated with feelings of anger or sadness or despair, loneliness, sorrow. And just feel them for a short time and then widen your awareness again. You know, stay with your awareness, maybe in the extremities, in the hands or in the soles of the feet. Yeah. And just stay where you can, wherever it feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. If it becomes too overwhelming, sometimes we might want to try walking meditation. And sometimes I think, you know, when people are having these kind of emotions arising, their walking can get quite fast, quite strong. <laughs> you know, you walk up and down, up and down the walking path. So it's a gradual process, and I think it's important always in the Buddha's teaching not to try to jump to the letting go before we've actually learned to meet our experience, because the Buddha did teach that, the, that suffering is to be understood, yeah? And it's in that understanding, through that understanding, that the letting go arises naturally. So I hope that gives some tips. And a couple more people have their hands up. Three more people. I'll Great. ask uh, Renny to unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Thank you. So I was like, because I, I mean, I grew up watching my parents, like just throwing their anger without any filter or any reflection. So when I watched that, I myself like trying to turn the other way around by I suppress my emotion a lot. And over the years, it's kind of like uh, accumulated somehow because I don't know how to express uh, when I'm angry or when I'm sad or whatever things, because mm -hmm. I feel like nobody's actually listening because my parents <laughs> basically like not even listening to each other. Yeah. So it's, uh, so I like, but then, I, after some time, I kind of realized it's really toxic to suppress all this emotion. And, but the thing is, I didn't know how to without like actually like almost like feel like, because whenever I feel like I'm telling some something to somebody, I feel like I'm, I am attacking somebody, mm. even though that person maybe not feel this that way, but I feel I'm attacking somebody. So mm. this kind of impression is like makes me really afraid to say something or speak up or mm. anything. So it's also not really a good way to do so because I feel like I, I'm being bullied all, all the time <laughs> because yeah. like people don't understand me and it's like, and I also have trouble 
uh, speaking out and telling anyone uh, how do I feel actually. Yeah. Then, uh, so I learned from my therapist. It's like I I have to own up to that feelings, but I also need to say that to that person. Like, okay, I feel I feel this way. I feel uh I feel sad or I feel angry or I feel frustrated when when you do this or when you say this. So it's also like inviting that person to to help them understand us better. Okay, okay. So when I say this, then she feels this way. So mm-hmm. I should learn to respect her, not to say that anymore. So yeah. or not to do that. So I think it's kind of a bit like uh, liberating in some, in some mm-hmm. way. I'm still learning to say that, but it's kind of liberating and like slowly I kind of like, so for me, it's like important for me to reflect on how I feel yeah. and uh, how this emotion is actually coming up. Uh, then just to say that to that person without like feeling I'm attacking them or I'm ever too late attacking them. So yeah. it's almost like there's a respect to that person, yeah. uh, like respecting probably they didn't know that when they did this, then it's actually affecting me. And it's also affect, uh, respecting my feelings as well. So mm. I kind of feel that method kind of helps me in a way. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe <laughs> it kind of like a bit of, yeah, I'm still learning. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I hope that can help others in the community. It's certainly inspiring to hear that from you because you've obviously, you know, really used a lot of mindfulness, a lot of compassion and deep listening, you know, to yourself and to others and, and come so far, you know, in understanding your own healing journey. Yes. And uh, I don't know, it sounds as though you've been practicing a form of nonviolent communication. Have you been following a uh, that sort of work uh, or have you I, come to this yourself because there are whole books on this uh I haven't read that book but i am because I'm I'm still like I'm communicating with my therapist so mm. she is like uh okay she, obviously she knows she learns about psychology and stuff and then I was like okay you have to practice this Rani and then so just slowly take a baby step and then it's like okay yeah. fine so yeah. I was like okay learning <laughs> it's 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 still difficult for me but yeah yeah fantastic yeah. yeah well I mean I think courage isn't about doing necessarily what's easy you know courage is about moving beyond our comfort zone sometimes and doing things that are not easy and having yeah. the confidence and the sadha, the trust within ourselves that you know you're coming from a good place you're coming yeah. from a place of kindness and also wisdom, yeah, because you've seen the effects of suppression and how that doesn't serve you in the long run. So yeah. it sounds really inspiring, actually. And yeah, well done. Well done. It's not <laughs> <Thank> easy. You. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I just hope that it might help anyone. <laughs> yeah, great. Really. Sure. Thank you. I will ask Victoria to unmute. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, and apologies, I joined a little late, so I, I wasn't able to hear the reading. Um, but I was thinking about your teaching before um, last week, I think, um, and the, the righteousness and how anger doesn't always feel bad. <laughs> and not only does it not always feel bad, but sometimes it can be a unifying factor, right? You and I have the same problem against somebody else. So we are in cahoots together. And then what happens when, I've been thinking about that a lot. Well, what happens when that person is taken out? Where does that that anger that has united us on this front go and reach out to? And so I think um, that can certainly spark the virulence of both, I'm building my own ego up because it feels good to be right <laughs> and how do I let go of that um, wanting to be right and also what kind of environment am I creating or fe- or feeding into um, by like 
pairing off or or being part of that us versus them um mindset I've been been thinking about that quite a bit uh with family (laughs) and the holidays yeah that are so pertinent to so many things that are happening in the world as well isn't it you know you can see that in um politics or in even this whole vaccinated versus anti-vaccinated and then that moves into belief systems around what corona really is or isn't you know (laughs) and all these ways in that we feel safe when we're around people who feel and think the same way as we do and it's really interesting that you mention it now because that's actually part of the next sutta (laughs) Um, (laughs) and one of the ways that resentment arises or gets consolidated because resentment is a very solidified and kind of stuck emotion is precisely that by saying you know I'm resentful towards people because they treat people that I agree with or that are my friends in a certain way so we form into little groups and little clubs but yeah very interesting question to ask you know what happens to that anger if that person is no longer there if we no longer can identify with a group um, a lot of the time we're left just boiling in our own anger and misery. And I think, you know, it's partly because we don't know how to handle those emotions within ourselves, which are very strong and coarse forms of suffering, that sometimes it feels tempting to just throw them outside, to project them onto others, you know, or onto the situation we experience in life. And really, it's a reaction to the way we feel inside. You know, and we're just blaming other people for that or other situations for that. And it, and they're just triggers for things that we are uncomfortable with within our own emotional world. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, we're so fortunate if we do happen to come in contact with a path and with tools and methods to help us start to turn inside. And, um, yeah, another point I wanted to mention in the context of Vinny's uh, um sharing was the importance of feeling safe you know in order to take that inner journey and to start unpacking some of these things I think it's really important to um, have people around us that are um, non-judgmental that accept us that you know don't challenge us or um, yeah that can allow us just to be and accept us as we are it's really important yeah Any more? I'll ask James to add uh, <coughs> Hi, James. Um, one thing I've been trying to do recently with anger is to try and sort of switch it over into compassion. Um, so like uh, a silly example is like um, if someone is driving and does something stupid, I might kind of think, well, you know, perhaps they're having a bad bad day, so they're distracted. Or I just think I kind of feel sorry for them. They haven't learned to drive properly. You know, (laughs) they keep driving like that. They're going to be in trouble. So I kind of turn that anger into something positive. And like a similar kind of thing is at work at the minute, we've got someone who's just absolutely awkward, absolutely everybody, and is is always, always a pain. And and I've just, I said to someone today that, I, I just think surely someone who's like that all the time must have learned somehow that that's the way to be, you know? So, you know, they've probably been treated badly, you know, they've probably faced a lot of hostility in their life as well. So hence they just give back what they perceive the world to be. So, so rather than being annoyed and angry with her, I kind of feel sorry for her, you know, you know what I mean? It's, um, I, I don't know if that's a skillful way of doing things or whether it's kind of suppressing or in any way, but, um, anyway (laughs) yeah thanks no I actually think that is quite skillful um and it's it is the start of compassion you know it is the beginning of compassion um because we don't know what's happened to a person so why should we always assume the worst I mean assuming the best and especially assuming that somebody is suffering when they're angry you know whether the suffering caused the anger or whether they're suffering right now because they're angry Either way, suffering is inevitably, you know, invariably present. Um, And so that's actually a view that I feel is closer to the Dhamma when we look at things that way. And even if we can't be sure, even if we give people the benefit of the doubt when they don't deserve it, 
still, if that's opening up your perception, you know, to take on another perspective or to stop yourself getting stuck in unwholesome states, then it is a skillful use of the mind. Um, it's what's discussed under the section in the gradual training called sense restraint, um, not dwelling on characteristics or behaviors or forms of speech in others that will cause you to feel irritated, <laughs> yeah? Um, but instead looking for the other side of that person. And in this case, perhaps the vulnerable side or the side you know, that sees that the person's struggling in some way. You don't have to know the details for that. You can pretty much assume that they are or that they will be <laughs> later on when you know, the work colleagues don't really enjoy working together with them. So yeah, I do think that's skillful. And uh, the Buddha talked about being able to use our senses in a way that you know, undermines unwholesome states or stops them arising in the first place and that cultivates the wholesome states and maintains them longer in our mind. And certainly, you know, if it's moving into genuine compassion, at first it may be more feeling sorry or maybe feeling pity. Perhaps there can be some ego still involved, like I'm not like that, you know. Um, but eventually that will purify and lead to compassion and then it can actually become a wholesome state. So, yeah. That's called, that's what Ajahn Brahm calls digging in the, um, the pile of dung, let's say, under the mango tree. So you take the dung, which is the suffering, and you dig it in and turn it into compassion in your heart. So that's great. And that's the right practice, I think, in daily life, because it's not like you can really go, I suppose you could hide in the toilet and do a few minutes meditation, <laughs> but um, it's probably better to sort of use the daily life and the sense restraint in a way of maintaining the mind so that you're not actually coming out of your day sort of feeling completely frazzled and really wound up, because then it's hard to sit on the meditation cushion. You're going to have fireworks or bombs going off within yourself so yeah it's good to uh, be able to adapt the buddha's teachings and the various aspects of the noble path according to the situation that you're in and later you can meditate and go a bit deeper yeah okay there's uh another comment i react to my teenager's anger because i feel like i have to as it is my motherly duty i guess that's the difference between responding and reacting yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a little bit what motivates it. So sometimes the reaction, it probably is a mixture, you know, between the compassion coming from a sense of duty and feeling that that's the best thing for your daughter, perhaps, or son. Um, and also perhaps some irritation and frustration or you know, a loss of patience at that point. I'm sure that I know for myself as a teenager, I would have tested many people's patience, especially my parents' patience. So um, you know, it may be a mixture. And I think responding just to me implies just a slight pause. Like there's a slightly bigger gap between the feeling you have, the impulse you have to maybe speak or act and the speech and action there's a slightly longer pause where there's a little bit of a chance for reflection to come in and for you to perhaps just like a camera, you know, when you're focused on something, you just, maybe it's a bit like you've got the flowers, but you've also got some mucky stuff or some rubbish in the, in the frame and you just incline it a bit more towards the flower and you cut out the, so just shift to the positive side of that intention, get more aligned to the beautiful intention in that. Because there is a certain, you know, you don't want to just allow every kind of behavior. Um, but yeah, of course, like uh, Renny was beautifully describing, there are also ways to speak, even to teenagers, that are less uh, inflammatory or maybe accusative. You know, maybe talk about how you feel when somebody behaves the way they do, rather than their behavior being wrong. Um, that can be, you know, genuinely express your concern or your worry um, and ask, you know, if there's any compromise you can come to, if there's anything, you, any place you can meet around that. Yeah, but I have no, you know, it's not really my place to advise on being a mother because <laughs> I chose not to be in this life. So. Okay, there's another question. Um, 
we still do have time. I'm, I'm kind of egging to get to the next bit, but I'll ask, answer this question. So even if we can understand many things with the teachings, at the moment when you feel all the intensity of anger, nothing seems to work. What to do in those moments? Yeah. Well, I think in that moment, if you really feel the intensity of the anger, that is your work <laughs> in a sense, right? Yeah. I mean, as long as you can stay at that feeling of the anger without reacting or taking it out on another person, then maybe that is the best you can do at that time. And, you know, acknowledge that, okay, right now, anger is arising and this feels intense. And when you make that really clear to yourself, you know, okay, I'm experiencing this feeling, try to locate it in your body, then already there's a little bit of breathing room around it. Um, and then you might be in a clearer position to decide what to do. And that might mean turning away from the situation that's fueling that anger, you know, literally just turning away from a person, walking out of the room for a while and just saying, you know, I just need to pause for a minute here, I'm coming back later. Or, you know, just the classic kind of uh, little tools we have in England, like drink a glass of water or count to 10, you know. I mean, they are kind of suppressive in a sense, but um, yeah, Janica said, just count to 10, it slows you down. Um, and then later you can, you know, come back to it when you're feeling a little bit more calm. I think it's important at those times, if you are needing to move away from someone or something to try to say that, you know, you're not rejecting them, but right now you need a break if, if at all possible. Um, or even just say, I'm feeling really angry and I don't want to cause more harm. I'm just going to, you know, walk off for a moment, <laughs> uh, just so that at least it doesn't move into unwholesome uh, bodily and verbal action. But if it does, please forgive yourself, you know, because we all do that all the time, right? It's not like in Buddhism, you go to hell if you shout at somebody or, you know, there's nothing like that. I mean, as long as you're trying sincerely on this path, there's always place for forgiveness. Uh, you can always ask forgiveness from another and also learn to forgive yourself, you know? So, yeah, I would say at that moment, try to get embodied and feel it in your body and... If that becomes really too intense, then maybe get outside, get some fresh air, you know, stamp on the ground or something, feel the ground beneath your feet. Um, and yeah, take a few breaths, you know, maybe breathe in and then breathe out really deeply. Like, <sighs> you know, these things are okay, right? You're not going to harm anyone that way. You're not going to harm yourself. So it's okay. It's normal to feel angry sometimes yeah okay shall we move on to the next passage yeah because this is kind of bringing a lot of what people have discussed already together uh themes around using thinking actually and in particular in this passage it talks about unskillful ways of thinking that causes to hold on to resentment so this is from the Anguttara Tens. So that's a clue that there'll be a list of 10. So you might want to take a pen and paper or just see if anything stands out to you. So Anguttara 1079 is called the grounds for resentment. So this time we'll use the word monastics. Monastics, there are these 10 grounds for resentment. What 10? Number one thinking they acted for my harm, one harbors resentment. So this is when we assume or ascribe intentions to another person. Number two, thinking they are acting for my harm. So this is in the present tense, one harbors resentment. Number three, thinking they will act for my harm, one harbors resentment. Number four, thinking they acted for the harm of one who is pleasing and agreeable to me. So this is where the group thing comes in. 
We identify with our friends and the people we love and somebody does something against them or we think somebody does something against them, we become angry and resentful. Number five, thinking they are acting for the harm of one who is pleasing and agreeable to me. One harbors resentment. Number six, thinking they will act for the harm of one who is pleasing and agreeable to me. One harbors resentment. It's quite interesting with the third one in each case, you know, thinking they will act for my harm or they will act for the harm of one who's pleasing and agreeable to me. I can feel a kind of emotional response there that that one is more concerning somehow because it involves so much uh, fear and worry about the future. It feels really like, I guess, closer to fear as well as resentment. Yeah. Shall I keep reading through and get to the end of the 10? So the next little group, thinking they acted for the benefit of one who is dis displeasing and disagreeable to me, one harbors resentment. Thinking they are acting for the benefit of one who is displeasing and disagreeable to me, one harbors resentment. Number nine, thinking, they will act for the benefit of one who is displeasing and disagreeable to me. One harbors resentment. And then the last one is that one becomes angry without a reason. That's quite interesting. These monastics are the 10 bases of resentment. So, Letting that settle, it's quite interesting, isn't it? That this is all about the use of thought and the way that that thought can really create our reality yeah? and lead to all kinds of views of others, perceptions of what may or may not happen in the future, or what did happen in the past. So this is called the Vipalasas in Pali, that thought, view and perception all reinforce each other and literally create delusion. Yeah. create a kind of fabricated reality that we then live in within our own body and mind. Yeah. And a lot of these, maybe that's why the third one in each category kind of struck me because nothing's actually happened there. <laughs> Nobody's actually acted in a harmful way or in a way that benefits people you don't like, but we're worried that they will. And so we have this resentment in our hearts. Hmm. It's quite interesting, isn't it? That, you know, we get angry when people harm those we love, but we also get angry when people act for the benefit of those we don't like. Have you noticed that? Has anyone noticed that? Maybe it's threatening to us that someone we, doesn't, we don't like, maybe, you know, has some advantage in life or has friends. Sometimes, you know, if somebody had really harmed you, say if, you know, someone you love had been killed, would you want that person, that person who killed to be happy? You know? Would you then like that person's friends or that person's, you know, the people in that person's life who make them happy? Or would your resentment spill over into them as well? It's hard to say, right? So any thoughts or questions around that? And it'd be also interesting to hear what you think about anger without a reason. Is there such a thing? We'll ask James to unmute. Hello. Hi. For some reason, this makes me think of something I learned about years ago called the uh, fundamental attribution bias or attribute <laughs> bias. It's when I think when if, if we do sort of like bad things, then we can kind of like. Um... Oh, you disappeared, James. Um, there you are. You came back again. 
yeah sorry <laughs> no it's the if 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 we act in bad ways we can we kind of um say oh i'm just having a bad day or i just made a mistake or you know i was distracted or something but if other people had in bad ways we tend to say they did it because they're a bad person you know so we forgive ourselves but we're quick to condemn, condemn others so mm -hmm. so with here with all the different people acting for harm it's not just necessarily the actions they've done you might also assume that they're actually a bad person which is a lot sort of more more severe i suppose you know like they're a bad person at heart like everything they do is going to be bad or i don't know i don't know if that's relevant at all <laughs> it just struck mm. yeah it is kind of relevant i think especially in this third case i don't know why i'm curious about this one but you know they will do something bad that could come from yeah. having so you, figured that they're just a bad person right yeah. so you expect only the worst from them right. which means you treat them badly which means you probably will only get the worst from them exactly mm. and this is how our thoughts views and perceptions create the world because you know if we if we expect someone to behave a certain way we treat them as you say in a way that would uh perhaps create that kind of behavior in them, or we wouldn't even notice when their behavior goes against the view we have of them. You know, we're just like literally looking out for cues and signs that confirm our views because we always think we're right. You know, human beings think they're right. <laughs> we land on perceptions of views that we think are right. <laughs> so not, not the That's things important. we don't think are right. Oh, sorry. No, go on, please. I was just going to say, so it's important to sort of stop and evaluate and think, well, do I really know this thing about this person? Do I really know that thing about that person? You know, so yeah, exactly. making assumptions. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And in this one also, a lot of it is um, making assumptions about their motivation. And that's even more subtle, isn't it? Than, you know, making assumptions about who they are as a person, making assumptions about their motivation is something we have absolutely no data on. We really, really don't know where that person's coming from. And I can see in my life that, yeah, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I really trust people, you know, and I kind of assume that they're motivated in the best possible way. And other times I see that, you know, it looks so obvious to me that somebody's acting out of jealousy or out of... Um, you know, wish to cause me harm. And later on, I ask them about it, if I can find a good way to approach it. And I get it, I've got it completely wrong. <laughs> I, I try to do that sometimes now with people, rather than making assumptions, actually ask them. And yeah. you often them, it's not what you think. Exactly. It's quite amazing when you realise that. And then you see that, gosh, I was just thinking that because of perhaps my past experience or my own particular um fears you know my own particular vulnerabilities say if you're somebody who fears um abandonment or rejection then you might presume that somebody is you know trying they don't like you they don't want to be around you but it's actually your own um conditioning that creates that perception so we cannot trust our thoughts <laughs> yeah. I will ask Darren to unmute. Thank you. Um, with the third one, is it around just thinking around expectations and attachment to those mm -hmm. expectations and the attachment to that resentment as well? And what my expectations of what that person is going to do? Um, mm -hmm. And when I let go of that attachment to those expectations, then I look at things differently, I perceive things differently. And I've had that with, um, <laughs> with work colleagues and, um, and with um, family members where I've known them for a, a long time. And because they've acted that way before or are acting that way as well, then my expectation is that they will act like that in the future when each moment is each moment. And I don't know what is going on in their mind. I don't know what their causes and conditions are, no matter how much I know, because they're putting on this veil of who that person is. Um, 
and it's my perception of of that which causes the resentment mm -hmm. and then causes that perpetual yeah. root of it and maybe why that number 10 and becomes angry without reason mm -hmm. i think maybe there is always going to be a reason but because we're so we sorry <laughs> one is so caught up in that cycle of um they acted they're acting they will act mm. it's just this constant chasing the tail mm. um i don't know mm. thank you yeah thanks a lot of insight there definitely yeah yeah it's almost like when we expect someone to behave a certain way because they have before we're not actually we're confining them we're imprisoning them we're not giving them the space to change or to show us another side of themselves. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And the anger without reason, yeah, that's a really interesting one. I was also thinking, wondering if another cause of that or, you know, seeming cause of that is, because like you say, I don't think there's ever really without a reason or not without a cause, let's say. Uh, but sometimes the cause could be, again, suppressed anger, <laughs> you know, so much of an accumulation of resentment or um, suppressed emotions within ourselves that we, we just blow up without real reason because something triggers us. We can't actually attribute it to that trigger. Uh, so somebody will say, well, why on earth are you upset about such a tiny thing or such a, you know, trivial thing? But there is a cause, even if there's not a reason. And that cause can go way back. Yeah. We'll ask Victoria to unmute. Um, yeah, so I think kind of building off of what Darren um, was just saying, I think that there's also a protective quality to that that loop tape <laughs> of okay if I if I put you into this box it's easier for me I just know I don't trust you instead of being able to see the fuller picture of how maybe in this moment that was something that felt wrong to me but that's not who you are in every moment mm. but we're so we have so many things we're classifying all of the time to build our worldviews of things and understanding of things that it's easier to say, well, you're not going to get me twice because I'm on to you, Betty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so again, it has that protective feeling to it when it's really just probably a residual resentment or hurt that we just haven't been able to push through or or really look at clearly mm -hmm. yeah it's a really good point and in that sense I mean that's why isn't it in life we go around sort of using perception in a way that at least um, labels and um, recognizes even if it's not with a judgment but we label and recognize certain things in our reality so that we feel safe, so that we feel we know where we are with things. Um, and yet we can bring that out toward others too, um, in a way that's so confining and um, a little bit premature quite often probably, because we are fear-based creatures and we obviously have self-protection instinct, you know, the animal instinct or the limbic system, whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah. I mean, this is around resentment and just being aware of not using our minds in ways that leads to that buildup of anger within ourselves. But at the same time, there's sometimes a wisdom in that, especially if you are, say, in an abusive situation, right? Then there might be good reason to say, okay, this person has, like, you know, been emotionally or physically abusive, even sexually abusive before. There is a good chance it could happen again. And do I want to? you know, try to trust this person again. Is it wise to do that? Do I have a support network or is it better to actually try to move out uh, of that situation, which could be incredibly harmful? And um, yeah, in that kind of situation, it can be very difficult because if we trust the other too much or if we give them the benefit of the doubt for too long, 
or don't or allow ourselves to get harmed to the degree that we don't have the confidence or courage anymore to know what to do maybe um then it can go the opposite way right we actually should have uh tried to move away earlier so it's a tricky one but this is about resentment so in that context yeah I think we're looking more at the workings of our mind and how we build our reality in ways that's not very helpful to us or others. Yeah. And of course, you can still be working on overcoming anger, even if you do have to leave a situation, right? It's not like, oh, I should work through my anger whilst I'm in a very dangerous situation without the support. You know, you can leave feeling angry, feeling hurt, and then go through your own healing and it might be necessary to go through your own healing far away. <laughs> yeah. Ajahn Brahm often says, love the tiger from a distance. So sometimes we can, uh, we can do that and that takes time. Uh, there's one more question in here. Uh, I seem to have a victim mentality in addition to having feelings of abandonment. So this is, very good because you understand your conditioning and you've identified um, some of your conditioning, you know, which is uh, very common. And I'm sure we can all relate to to some extent. Yeah. And I'm sure that's not all that you are or that you, you know, are conditioned to be. Um, but it's the start, isn't it, to see, oh, look, you know, I keep moving into victim role in this particular situation. And, you know, notice that, but also perhaps notice when you don't. Otherwise, again, we can kind of get upset with ourselves, right? And think that we're always going to be like that and turn this resentment towards ourselves. I guess this whole sutta could apply to ourselves as well. Thinking I acted for my harm, one harbors resentment, right? Thinking I am acting for my harm, one harbors resentment, etc. It could be self-inflicted as well. Um, so this is just conditioning and it's good to notice it. And also to realize that if there were feelings or a tendency to, you know, being worried about, I'm presuming here you mean fear of abandonment rather than feeling to abandon others, yeah? Um, I mean, what I do, because I think that's my deeper fear too, like there's a few, like there's fear of rejection, abandonment, I forget the others. Mm, but anyway, abandonment, I think is the one. There's also fear of, Pain. I'm not sure which psychological model it is now. Um, but what that helps me to do is realize that if I'm feeling that I might be abandoned, it could be, um, there could be some truth in it, but there's a strong likelihood that my own fears of abandonment are adding to that risk, which is actually much smaller than it seems. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then we can start to question our reality and undermine those. Uh, fears within ourselves and the um spelling of papancha is p-a-p-a-n papan c c a i think yeah so it's just a at the beginning there like this yeah uh, and it means um papancha means like proliferation so that's when the thinking just kind of goes a little bit astray and kind of keeps on looping around the same theme and going off in all directions, usually very much conditioned by our fears and our anxieties. Um, and it goes into directions whereby we just tie ourselves in knots, you know. Um, so it's, it's just thinking on a little bit wild. We all do it. It can also just be kind of useless thoughts, just kind of speculating on things that aren't really important to suffering and the end of suffering for example, speculating on all kinds of things. Yeah, someone saying, I have a close friend who was traumatized and became angry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, it carries on, sorry. Um, uh, traumatized and became angry with pretty much everyone. She's better now, though it took years. Whenever she gets angry, how can I respond wisely to help her or should I? perhaps just listen. See, I think it's one and the same. Responding wisely may well be just listening. And that is a response, you know, it's not nothing. It's not a vacuum. 
if you can actually fill the space between you with real kindness and acceptance, you know, whereby you're listening internally to yourself, to your own maybe wish at times to react or respond to your own emotions and just stay with that with kindness and allow this person the space, then I think that can be incredibly healing. Because one of the things I think with trauma, and it depends on the kind of trauma, but you know, it's a very intense experience and quite often not one that others can understand. And so to be sort of told, well, get over it, or, and I'm not saying you're doing this at all, um, but this is common, you know, for people who care about others, we want them to just get over things or let go of things, but we're really not in their shoes. You know, if it was possible for her to do that straight away, I'm sure she would. Um, so it might be something that's very impacting and it makes her feel isolated or alone and that others can't understand. And so by listening, you know, and just by showing that you've got all the time in the world for this person, then she, it gives her hope that somebody does care and somebody is interested in understanding. And that can um, resolve any feelings of isolation or um, disconnection that can happen through trauma. Yeah, so I think that's a really wonderful, intuitively wise idea to just listen. And then, you know, if you are also listening, like I said, internally to yourself, you might find that the right words just come at the right time. Yeah. You might just find that. And sometimes it doesn't have to be much. You know? So, yeah. It's great that she's getting better too. And it can take years, of course, of course. And we never know the other trauma that someone's been through earlier that might have been similar, you know. We never know exactly how it affects another person. So I think all the little messages about donations are coming in the chat box, which is probably a cue for me to stop talking. And it's very great that we could end today at the end of a little passage. So it feels nicely wrapped up and yet still a lot more to unwrap and uncover in this chapter. I think it's really quite fascinating and really enriching to hear from everybody here. Thank you so much. It's uh, I'm just really pleased that we can have such beautiful, open, uh, courageous discussions and um, hopefully know that we're not being judged in this space. So thank you very much. And I'll hand over to whoever would like to say a few words before I remind you of the next events. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Venerable Chanda practices generosity through sharing the Dharma with all of us. And this offers those who value this an opportunity to practice generosity too by providing for her material needs. If you are able to contribute, your donations will be deeply appreciated. They will enable Venerable Chanda not only to continue spreading the Dharma, but will also greatly support the development of the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK, the wider aim of our project. You can find out more details about the project and how to donate on the Anukampa website, and the link is also in the chat box. Thank you very much. And thanks to my wonderful co-host. Thank you. You always do such a lovely job. So Matthias, I think, was recording and Gunther's doing the Dana talk today. It's always the job that takes the most courage, I think, and then Kelly on the q &A. So, and also they're doing a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure this is a really safe space. And that's one of the reasons we um, have the mute on just to let those who are new know because uh, we were once soon bombed and it wasn't very pleasant at all people can come in and start shouting all sorts of silly things uh, <laughs> so this is why we do it but it's really lovely to hear from you all and uh yeah there's also anna here by the way she wasn't really in the picture do you want to just show your face and say hi because there's another person in the room today and I'm staying with Anna so she was here she just hello didn't, everybody didn't say anything <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to but somehow oh, okay. I didn't want to interrupt I know but you're part of the group next time next time so uh I was going to say something else and I've lost my train of thought mm. but yeah about the events that are coming up so tomorrow we have quite a full day tomorrow morning we're having a meta meditation from nine till 10 GMT, so UK time. 
Uh, most of you are probably an hour ahead. Most of you, I think. Or some, well, no, actually, there's people from all over the world here. So, <laughs> uh, and then at 1:30 p.m. GMT tomorrow, we have Jetson Matenzin Palmo, who is the most senior bikini. Western bikini or white bikini, I should properly say, I think in the world, as far as I know, she's more senior than Ajahn Brown. So she ordained ooh, a long time ago, very long time ago. And she's a very wonderful bikini in the Mahayana tradition, um, which shares a common root with us. So these are really artificial differences or artificial divisions between the various groups in Buddhism. But uh, she will have a different take on the Dhamma because I think some of the literature is a bit different. Some of the doctrine has differences, but mostly it has many, many similarities and I'm sure can be enriching for your practice and hopefully for your inspiration as well. Uh, what else is happening? And then next week, as usual, the chanting, I guess, and uh, another sutta class next week. So I really look forward to that. And uh, we'll let you go and wave goodbye. So we normally unmute everybody so that we can hear your lovely voices. Thank you for being here.